Greetings, and welcome to Theology Thursdays. We are starting in full the rule of St. Benedict, the spirituality for the 21st century here in this video. Now, before we get started, though, a little introduction to how the book looks. You will notice when you go through and read, beginning with our prologue this morning, that there are going to be um, texts at the top of the pages, especially above the readings from the Rule of St. Benedict, that will have dates on them. During the regular rotation of daily prayer for Benedictines, there also is a reading from the actual rule of which they are living under, the Rule of St. Benedict. Well, the reading of that rule occurs once a day from a certain section, and um, is uh, meant to remind monastics that are under its rule about the things that they have, um, they are under the obedience to. Well, Sister Joan has taken that format and has put it into a, a similar format in which um, novices, such as us, beginners, are slowly making our way through the rule of St. Benedict in a little uh, bite-sized portion sort of way. And this is why the book is uh, structured in the devotional format, so that we can reflect over the rule of St. Benedict in these little snippets, so that we're able to get a fuller picture and a fuller reflection over what the rule is trying to say. Now, the way that this is going to go is that there is a reflection over the particular readings for that particular day, hence why it's a devotional format. But what Sister Joan is also going to be doing is making very clear, I think, um, the ways in which perhaps this rule, even though it was written so, so very long ago for a very specific community, actually has applications far beyond its original context and has many things to teach us today things about Christian prayer, Christian community, and many other subjects that affect the way that we live our everyday lives of discipleship. But, to use Sister Joan's own words, the funny thing about the Rule of St. Benedict is that it's so practical, it's so, as she would say, unvarnished, that uh, it, it makes it extremely clear what St. Benedict is talking about. He doesn't uh, mince words, so to speak. He's very direct in the way that he communicates. But it's complete directness, it's uh, complete uh, in obscurity, so to speak, um, also makes it a little bit of a challenge for an interpretive jump. So when he begins talking about the kinds of monastics that exist, we might be tempted to say, well, I'm not a monk, why does this apply to me? Well, Sister Joan is going to actually show us the principles of the rule are meant to apply to the Christian life in general. Monastics, of course, specifically, but there are general themes and deep-held convictions about what exactly we're doing as Christians as it comes to the lived tradition. That apply not only to monastics, but also to anyone who walks a life of obedience in Christ. So, what we're going to do in the format of this book is we're going to have the reading from the section of which we're talking about, and we're simply going to go through by section as we go along into not necessarily uh, one week at a time, but a certain amount of sections per uh, video reflection that we have. And so, beginning today, we'll simply hear from the Rule of St. Benedict in the small readings, and then we'll have a little bit of a talk over the themes that, that Sister Joan is trying to bring out of these passages. And so, as we jump in, the readings from the Rule of St. Benedict will be put up for you to see and also to hear, and then we'll have a little bit of a reflection over what exactly is going on in these particular passages. Listen carefully, my child, to my instructions, and attend to them with the ear of your heart. This is advice from one who loves you. Welcome it and faithfully put it into practice. The labor of obedience will bring you back to God from whom you had drifted through the sloth of disobedience. This message of mine is for you, then, if you are ready to give up your own will once and for all, and armed with the strong and noble weapons of obedience, 
to do battle for Jesus, the Christ. A major theme in the Desert Fathers and Mothers, of which St. Benedict is one of them, is the theme of awareness, or particularly the lack of awareness. The awareness of one's life, attentiveness to the way that one lives one's life, and also attentiveness to the care that we must show for our neighbor, is one of the principal teachings of the 4th century monastics. And St. Benedict leads off with this particular reflection because he's trying to get our attention. And now that might seem colloquial in the way that we use this, but in a deep sense, a life that we live without paying attention to it is not a life lived at all. If we are not conscious to the way that we're living our life, are we really living at all? It's perhaps a little bit too easy to apply this to our modern day circumstance in which we are tempted to be distracted by many things of entertainment, of, you know, all kinds of distractions that we can put in front of ourselves so that we don't have to pay attention to our lives, particularly the uncomfortable, messy, and parts of our lives that we'd rather not pay attention to. Benedict, very directly, is asking us not just to pay attention for our own sake, but for the sake of the one who is calling us, who loves us. Notice he says, this is a note from someone who loves you, that if you are ready to live a life of obedience, to live a life of attentiveness to how we live, to, as he says, live a life of giving up your will and rather obedience to a will higher than ourselves. Benedict is asking the ultimate question, are we willing to give up what we would rather do so that we might apply ourselves to live holy lives? For those who take up this particular mantle of obedience, Benedict says, this is for you whom I love. This is the path of attentiveness and wisdom, to live an examined life, a life in which we are aware and paying attention, a life in which we put down the phone, put down the tablet, turn off the TV, and actually, in a very serious sense, apply ourselves to attentive living. St. Benedict teaches very clearly that Spirituality is not something that we simply do naturally. In fact, attentiveness to our lives is not something that we ever uh, consciously or unconsciously do, I guess I should say. It's never something that we just do by happenstance. Rather, it is an intentional activity. And in order to take on any intentional activity, we have to have intentionality, awareness, and willingness to take up that sort of practice. First of all, every time you begin a good work, you must pray to God most earnestly to bring it to perfection. In God's goodness, we are already counted as God's own, and therefore we should never grieve the Holy One by our evil actions. With the good gifts which are in us, we must obey God at all times, that God may never become angry, an angry parent who disinherits us, nor the dreaded one, enraged by our sins, who punishes us forever as worthless servants, for refusing to follow the way of, to glory. Two principles of God's providence are brought up in this first little passage. One perhaps obvious, and one maybe not so obvious. The first is that, through God's love and grace, we are already counted as God's own. As Sister Joan comments, the one who prays to God has, in some sense, already been brought into the presence of God, even in that moment. To put it another way, when we are drawn to prayer, when we are drawn to living obediently before God, we are, in some sense, already in the presence of God. 
we have, in some sense, already been found by God. God has simply got our attention, finally. It's not that God has ever been distant, it's that God has been so present, and it's perhaps us who have had a failure of attentiveness. But rather, we are meant to be reminded very truly that we have been given a grace that is costly. We've been given a grace that is powerful, a grace that, as Sister Joan might say, is volatile, something that needs to be treated with care and something that needs to be treated with respect. And which brings us to the second principle that might not be so obvious. We might um, hinge ourselves a little closely on the negative aspects that Benedict brings up about God disinheriting, becoming angry. But we have to understand when Benedict writes this, Patrilineal heritage within the 6th century, especially in Italy, was something of sort of a life-or-death manner. The father of the household, to be living under the household of the father, is to be living under the provision of the father. In that particular system of family, to be disinherited from that is to be counted as good as dead. One is cut off from the provision of the father, and this is at a time when paid labor was looked down on in society. To be a paid laborer was to be someone of the lowest class. Those who lived under the provision of the patrilineal Roman household were to be favored. And so what Benedict is bringing up in this is that to live in such a way to be aware of the provision of God the Father already through his grace is in a parallel fashion to be living as a son or daughter of the Most High. And to not be living as such, to be um, not paying attention to that, or even worse, to be refusing that, is to be cut off from life itself. To understand God's grace is to understand the demand that God has put on us to live holy lives, not just lives of what we will to do, but rather obedience to what the Father knows is best for us. Because again, in this parallel fashion, God the Father is the perfect Father, not an earthly father or a Roman father of the 6th century that can disinherit someone on a whim, but rather the perfect just father who desires for us to be in obedience to that which gives us life. For to not do so means to live, as Sister Joan would say, a living death. Let us get up then at long last, for the scriptures rouse us when they say it is high time for us to arise from sleep. Let us open our eyes to the light that comes from God and our ears to the voice from heaven that every day calls out this charge. If you hear God's voice today and do not harden your hearts, and again, you that have ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And what does the Spirit say? Come and listen to me, and I will teach you to reverence God. Run while you have the light of life, that the darkness of death may not overtake you. Benedict begins his injunction to those under this rule as one who desires to live wisely. And this is the first of many, many long sections of the rule in which he directly quotes from Scripture. And it makes it very clear to those who are under the obedience to this rule that this is not a self-help sort of thing. This is not uh, obedience to a private guru or um, a self-help sort of way, but we are, in fact, disciples of the wisdom of Jesus Christ. We are meant to listen to how we should live. And the way that we should live is deeply formed, first and foremost, by the revelation of the wisdom of God in the scriptures. You see, for St. Benedict, the reflection on the scriptures, 
and the guidance of the holy writ of God is the way of one of which one primarily patterns one's life after. Those who desire to live a wise life are those who desire to listen to the Spirit, and those who desire to listen are instructed. But we can never be instructed if we are not first listening, and we can never first listen if we do not know whom we are listening to. The reflection on the scriptures is that penitential action that we are turning from one way of going, our own way, and turning towards an obedient path of God's will, which is revealed in the scriptures. And in the rule of St. Benedict, what Benedict is making real clear is that we are disciples of Christ and fellow laborers. We are running towards that which we are trying to gain or accomplish. So the scriptures for St. Benedict are the most important guide to obedience in Christ. This is, in fact, one of the key points in which, as we continue to move on in our life under obedience to the law of Christ, we are, in fact, marathon runners, running towards that which we are trying to accomplish. We're not simply setting out on this journey haphazardly or even worse, we're not simply sitting around and waiting for something to happen. We are, in fact, running towards God because God desires for us to have life and have it abundantly. Seeking workers in a multitude of people, God calls out and says again, Is there anyone here who yearns for life and desires to see good days? If you hear this and your answer is, I do, God then directs these words to you. If you desire true and eternal life, keep your tongue free from vicious talk and your lips from all deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Let peace be your quest and aim. Once you have done this, my eyes will be open to you. My eyes will listen to your prayers. And even before you ask me, I will say to you, here I am. What is more delightful than this voice of the Holy One calling to us? See how God's love shows us the way of life? Clothed then with faith and performance of good works, let us set out on this way with the gospel for our guide, that we may deserve to see the Holy One who has called us to the eternal presence. In this initial reflection of St. Benedict over the work of those who are called to obedience under the rule, we have one of the most famous summations of the Benedictine life made very obvious in the first little bit of this reflection over St. Benedict, which is the Latin phrase ora et labora, or prayer and work. Benedict is making very clear we are not merely doing a set of asceticisms that is completely private, nor are we simply throwing ourselves to the wind without any attention to the most important ground of life. We are doing both of those in a balance, a stability, in which we are both as best as we can and as God gives us strength to be attentive to the center of all things, God, our loving Father, and to perform the works necessary that we grow in holiness. This is the root of when he says, those who first want to take upon this rule, he then gives a very clear practical injunction. Do not talk viciously at other people. Do not lie. Do not say whatever you want to say, but rather discipline your very mouth in the way that you speak. The Christian life is intimately tied up with the lives of others. And the Christian life is not one, again, of a private sort of matter. It's not, it really is not between me and Jesus. It's between we and Jesus. And in fact, the content of the life of the spiritual worker in Christ is fed by the service of others, the self-giving to others, 
In the same way that patterning our life after Christ is indeed the sacrifice of self-will. Remember, Benedict talks that if we are finally ready to give up our self-will to the will of God, we must do so in this fashion. We must not blithely walk through life inattentively, but neither can we retreat from our life, can we retreat from interaction with others. Instead, we have to learn how to love and live with others. The content of the spiritual life in Christ, the content of life over death is, con is in this. It is none other than the way of life, than to learn how to live together. And, and as we said before, this Christian practice is not about a mere private religiosity that we shun all others to go and find ourselves or find God in. Rather, it is a dedication, it is a rule of which we slowly train in being able to learn, see, and love others even as we see, love, and follow the God who loves us. If we wish to dwell in God's tent, we will never arrive unless we run there by doing good deeds. But let us ask with the prophet, who will dwell in your tent, O God? Who will find rest upon your holy mountain? After this question, then, let us listen well to what God says in reply, for we are shown the way of God's tent. Those who walk without blemish and are just in all their dealings, who speak truth from the heart and have not practiced deceit, who have not wronged another in any way, not listened to slanders against a neighbor. They have foiled the evil one at every turn, flinging both the devil and these wicked promptings far from sight. While these temptations were still young, the just caught hold of them and dashed them against Christ. These people reverence God and do not become elated over their good deeds. They judge it is God's strength, not their own, that brings about the good in them. They praise the Holy One working in them and say with the prophet, Not to us, O God, not to us give the glory, but to your name alone. Benedict attempts to describe one of the main paradoxes in the spiritual life of Christ, which is that we are called to do good deeds for others unequivocally. There is no way that we can be a Christian and say that we are a follower of Christ if we do not do the works of Christ. And yet, it is not by our efforts, it's not by our own training, that we are able to do good at all. Benedict says these things in the context of two opposite polarities. Benedict lives in the 600s. And in the asceticism of the early monastics of his time, we have two particular expressions of which he is attempting to drive a middle between. The first is, the early Christian ascetics were known for their intense ascesis, training in forsaking and giving up the worldly things and focusing on the spiritual things. But one can take that in such a direction that it becomes such a paragon of selflessness that we begin to do damage to ourselves. This is the whole concept of eating very little, starving oneself to focus on the spiritual goods rather than the physical, of sleeping on beds of nails even uh, to show that I am mortifying my flesh. Benedict, instead of putting the onus on us training up ourselves in righteousness instead says first that the content of good deeds to dwell in God's tent, as he says, is this, to live well with others, to do good things for those who live around us. That's something that every person can do, but it is still hard work. But on the other end, Benedict is also teaching against a particular wandering monk named Pelagius, who said that 
one can actually become perfect before God without any assistance. This is something of which we have in our created goodness. We are able to do well just by ourselves. On the other hand, Benedict says, no, we must constantly hold up in front of us that any good that we do is only by God's enlivening of us to do so. We are only able to do good because of God, not the other way around. We are only able to do good to the poor because God gives us the ability to do so. We are only able to speak kind words because Christ gives us the words to do so. It is constantly this humility that we hold out in front of ourselves, such that even the greatest saint is the one for whom knows the depths of which God's grace goes through them, rather than God's grace has been shown by them, by their own efforts. Instead, the true saint for Benedict is the one for whom humility is constantly in front of, of whom never believes it is by their own that they are able to do good, but rather that it is God who does good through them. In just this way, Paul the Apostle refused to take credit for the power of his preaching. He declared, by God's grace, I am what I am. And again, Paul said, they who boast should make their boast in God. That is why it is said in the gospel, whoever hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise person who built a house upon rock. The floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house, but it did not fall. It was founded on rock. With this conclusion, God waits for us daily to translate into action, as we should, these holy teachings. Therefore, our lifespan has been lengthened by way of a truce, that we may amend our misdeeds. As the Apostle says, do you not know that the patience of God is leading you to repent? And indeed, God assures us in love, I do not wish the death of sinners, but that they turn back to me and live. It is so easy, so easy, to see God as the goal or the pinnacle of where I am trying to work myself towards. I am I am going to church on every Sunday. I am saying my daily prayers. I am reading my Bible every day. If we only treat those as check marks on the list of things that I do to gain God's favor somehow, to make God pay attention to me. Benedict says, we have that all wrong. Rather, what St. Paul teaches us is that God's grace is at work in all of that already. God's presence is making things manifest in our lives already, and that it is not us that are trying to get God's attention, it is, in fact, the other way around. We are, in fact, needing of waking up. We are meant to become aware of God already doing stuff. God is not somewhere far off, and we have to try to wave our hands down here to try to get his attention. Rather, what the point of all of our practice of Christ, our practice of our rule of life, as in the rule of St. Benedict, is to become increasingly aware and increasingly appreciative of the fact that God is constantly present in our lives. Our asceticisms, our fasting, prayers, reading of scripture, going to church, that is meant for us to become awake to the reality of God, to be brought out of our drunkenness, to be woken from our sleep, to be so made aware of God that we cannot otherwise be unaware of God in the rest of our lives, such that the God that we come to worship on Sundays is perhaps the God who becomes so, so very obvious even when doing the dishes. That's the goal of the spiritual life. Not that we might attain to God as if that's something that we can ever do ourselves again, but rather that we are simply 
becoming more aware, becoming more open to God's presence with us even right now. Now that we have asked God who will dwell in the holy tent, we have heard the instruction for dwelling in it, but only if we fulfill the obligations of those who live there. We must then prepare our hearts and bodies for the battle of holy obedience to God's instructions. What is not possible to us by nature, let us ask the Holy One to supply by the help of grace. If we wish to reach eternal life, even as we avoid the torments of hell, then while there is still time, while we are in this body and have time to accomplish all the things by the light of life, we must run and do now what will profit us forever. Sister Joan talks about an illustration of when someone once said a very famous quote, and the quote goes like this, Sinners, in fact, are much closer to God than saints. Someone asked how this could be. The spiritual teacher says, God tethers us by strings, such that we are tethered to God by a length of string. And whenever we break our relationship with God, we are the ones with the scissors who cut that string. But yet God constantly takes the string and ties it again. But every time that the string is tied, it uses more of the length, such that God and the sinner that keeps cutting the string keeps getting tied and tied and tied and tied and tied, and even in the weakness of our sin is actually an avenue for being closer to God. Benedict is trying to say those who dwell in the holy tent, using the uh, illustration of the tabernacle in the um, Old Testament, those who dwell in the tent are obligated to do the things of Christ. But it is not by our own merit that we are able to attain the things of Christ. It is by Christ's good grace alone that we are able to do that. And because it is by God's good grace alone that we can do that, our failings, as constant as they might be, must never be a discouragement. The failings that we experience are part of our limited mortality. They are part of our limitedness, our brokenness, the very evidence that we need God in the first place. But I think even more poignantly, that even those failings can be avenues by which we are slowly brought closer to God. It's the inverse of maybe what we think about when we think about attaining to God. Well, those people who attain to God, they go to church on Sundays, and they um, say their prayers every day, and they read their Bible every day. Rather, what Benedict is saying is that these rules are indeed good for life, and they are obligations on us, but they should never be equated with closeness and relationship with God. You can read your Bible every single day and still not get the relationship with God that is, that is appropriate. Likewise, there can be some that are afraid to even darken the doors of church by their many, many failings in their life that are nonetheless tethered even closer to God than they can ever imagine. The rule of life is not about us being good enough. The rule of life is about repentance, because God never fails us. We fail God, most certainly, but God never fails us. But we should never get into this, this game of asking ourselves, am I ascetic enough to be a monk? Am I good enough to be um, one of God's favorites? It's not how things work in the spiritual life in Christ. Rather, even in our failure, we are brought ever more present into the intimacy of God's grace. Therefore, we intend to establish a school for God's service, 
in drawing up its regulations, we hope to set down nothing harsh, nothing burdensome. The good of all concerned, however, may prompt us to a little strictness in order to amend faults and to safeguard love. Do not be daunted immediately by fear and run away from the road that leads to salvation. It is bound to be narrow at the outset. But as we progress in this way of life and in faith, we shall run on the path of God's commandments, our hearts overflowing with inexpressible delight of love. Never swerving from God's instructions then, but faithfully observing God's teaching in the monastery until death, we shall, through patience, share in the sufferings of Christ, that we may deserve also to share in the eternal presence. Amen. keeping with the paradox that St. Benedict is going for, we are also reminded that the spiritual life doesn't just happen by accident. The spiritual life is ordered. It is chosen. It is dedicated. It is something that is not haphazard. It is something that requires patience. It requires endurance. Now, it's helpful to note that Benedict, in laying out the prologue of the Rule of St. Benedict, makes very clear that he's not trying to lay out anything burdensome or undue. As opposed to perhaps other monastics at the time, Benedict is not interested in laying out a heavy-duty sort of curriculum of spiritual gymnastics. What Benedict is interested in is constancy, stability, the ability to do things slowly as a process. That's why he calls it a school. That these things, by patience, are meant to be learned both through the ways that we pray them and the ways that we do them. It's meant to be a formative way of living life. It's not meant to be these extravagant forms of spirituality. If you've ever seen Benedictines, the last thing you think about Benedictines is it's extravagant. Rather, it is about constancy. About, again, the whole Benedictine notion of being stable. Being able to slowly, methodically, but surely move from one place to the next in the spiritual life. The spiritual life is not something in which we are meant to have a flash in the pan and say, okay, we're done. It's meant to be lifelong, something that is constantly in our minds and in the training of the school to be able to be taken anywhere we go in life, such that when we are such a part of that curriculum, so to speak, we cannot help but have in the front of our minds prayer, presence, and understanding of God's ever-flowing grace, such that no matter whether we are in the sanctuary praying before the Blessed Sacrament of God's presence, or we are in the mess hall cleaning up after lunch, we are ever reminded of God's continuing presence in various and different ways, but nonetheless still the constancy of God among us. The message of the prologue of St. Benedict is meant to make very clear on the outset what Benedict is not doing. It should be pretty obvious from what Benedict is saying is that what we are not doing is we are not trying to make super-Christians. We're not trying to make people who are spiritually superior to the rest of the world. What we're trying to do is we're trying to faithfully live out the grace of God, which is extended to everyone, full stop, end of sentence. It's extended to absolutely everyone who is called by God. And as he says in the very center, you know, those who are called to this work in God, the things that we are meant to do is to learn how to live well amongst each other. Benedict is not necessarily calling us to go out to the desert. Benedict is not necessarily asking us to go and live on top of a spire for the rest of our lives. We'll talk about 
uh, St. Simeon the Stylites, a guy who lived on a pole for a bit, a very wild story that is, Benedict is not about cre uh, is not about creating these paragons of spirituality. Benedict is about forming a community of people who are broken and in need of God, who are devoting themselves to a rule to better love God and each other. It's a very simple sort of rule, but it's also extremely profound. It is not something that we do by our own religiosity. In fact, as Benedict said, those who boast should boast in God, as the Apostle Paul says, not in the things that we do. Those who want to make much of themselves ought to be careful, because we must walk in utter humility of Christ in order to receive the blessings of Christ. The whole point of the south side of the prologue is that we're not doing anything that is meant to burden us, that is meant to drag us down. Rather, what is going on is we are meant to live an ordered life, an intentional life that trains up in us the awareness of the presence of God. At prayer, at work, in any part of life, we are a part of a school, the school of love, and most specifically, the school of Benedict of Nursia.